Hey, everyone. Welcome to our Asset Management Friday segment of the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. I'm your co-host, Kyle Mitchell, also joined by Gary Lipsky. This is a new segment that we're recently launched that focuses on educating operators, building better systems, and becoming a best-in-class operator. Be sure to check out our Facebook group, Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate. All right. Today on the show, we have Mauricio Raul. Welcome, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. So tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do. Yeah, so I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Premier Law Group. We are a syndication law firm and also a real estate transactional. So 100% of my practice is helping real estate syndicators raise capital to go buy big apartment buildings. And then uh, my partner, Carrie, is her goal. Her, her, she's been a 20-year attorney uh, that, that deals on the real estate side on the transactional. So she's the one that helps with the purchase and sale agreements and the lender and all that stuff while we, we focus on the capital raising side of it. Nice, nice. Uh, thank you, uh, Mauricio. So let's talk about the legal side of, of asset management. So you signed a PSA, you need to form an entity. What are the do's and don'ts of, of that? Yeah, so step one is typically you'll enter into a PSA prior to creating the LLC that you're ultimately going to uh, buy the property in. So it's critical from the legal perspective to make sure that PSA is entered into with however you're entering into, maybe it's your personal name, maybe it's Louis Gary. Uh, and then, but you've got to add the words or assignee, that's the legal term. So you want to be able to assign that contract to the entity when that entity is created. So that's step number one. And you want to have some language in the PSA that, that allows you to do that without having to get approval from the, from the seller. Then you actually create the LLC itself. And typically we want to create that LLC in the state where the property is located. A lot of people think, hey, should I set up in Delaware or Nevada or all these great states that people have heard of? But the reality is the property is in whatever state, let's say it's Texas, the property is in Texas, which means Texas laws are going to apply anyway if something happens to your building, if, if a tenant gets injured or something happens. So we always create the LLC uh, in, in the state where the, where the property is located. Um, so that's one thing we want to keep, keep track of. And the other thing we want to make sure is that when you're, creating and figuring out who the manager of that LLC is, just make sure that you have a separate entity there for asset protection purposes. Nice, nice. What are the three things that an asset manager should know from a legal perspective besides, besides that contract piece? Yeah, so uh, one of the things, well, actually that's a good segue. So one of the things you, from a legal perspective, you wanna make sure that the entity that's asset man, you wanna have a separate entity that's doing the asset management that is not the same entity that owns your share of the building. So typically when you do a syndication, you may only own 20% or 30% or 10% of the building. You wanna make sure that your asset management company is different from the 20% ownership because all of the liability is at that asset management company level. So that's step number one. And that's, a, that's primarily an asset protection thing. The other thing you wanna make sure is recognize that you're the asset manager, you're probably going to be hiring a property manager, right? So you're going to hire a property manager. You're going to supervise them. You are legally responsible for the acts and emissions of that property manager. So it's critical to make, to number one, understand that. And number two, make sure that they are added to your insurance policy. Because we've had this issue before where property managers may have some issues with some of the tenants. For example, we had a case once where we had some little sexual harassment issues going on with some of the property managers. And so if there's a lawsuit for that, you as the property manager, I'm sorry, as the asset manager and the asset owner are going to be legally responsible for that. So just make sure that you have that asset protection, I'm sorry, that insurance in place, uh, which is why, again, you also want to have the asset protection separating your, your, your liability producing company from, uh, from the ownership. Nice. Great stuff. Um, so... Um, backtracking a little bit, when, when would you start a PPM and, and what, do you, what do you need to get for your attorney so he can be successful in putting that together? Yeah, great question. Um, I have a little bit of a different take than some others. Uh, you really want to reach out to your attorney right away. Like as soon as you enter into an LOI or have an LOI accepted, reach out to the attorney. Um, and, and the first thing you're going to have to bring to your attorney is that business plan. So in our firm, what we do is we send out a questionnaire, a very detailed questionnaire that you need to fill out, but we also ask you to bring in your business plan. And we spend a lot of time on that business plan, kind of tearing it apart and underwriting it, which we do for everyone. But those two things are really step one. So that's when the attorney officially kind of gets involved. As soon as you're done with that asset, with that business plan, you're going to send that over to the attorney. That gets the process started. That's where we find out what your deal is about. And, and that's how we start extracting the information from you. So we know what to put into the PPM. Because as you know, 
the PPM in and of itself is kind of worthless if you just pull one from the internet or use a template. It's what you put into the PPM that's important, especially these days, super important that what's in the PPM. And the only way an attorney can really find out what needs to go in the PPM is by understanding your deal, asking you a ton of questions. And the way we do it is, is pulling information from that business plan in those interactions that we have. Nice. So uh, I see a lot of people doing this wrong with the 506B, raising money and the things they do on the internet. What are like the three things that like you cringe at that you see all the time? Um, people forget with a 506B that you cannot advertise. And so I cringe whenever I see um, anything that obviously anything that relates to your offering on internet on a 506B freaks me out, but I don't see too many of those direct ones. It's the conditioning the market uh, posts that drive me, that made me super nervous. Uh, one of them makes me really nervous. It really, and by the way, let me just backtrack. The conditioning the market means anything that drums up interest about your deal, even though it's not a specific post about your deal. So you might be talking about due diligence. You might be talking about your, hey, you're at the property and you're walking the units, which is fine, but then you start bringing up the indirectly that everybody knows you're raising money. The one that makes me cringe um, is that post-closing post. The one where everybody celebrates and says, hey, super happy to announce that me and my team and our investors, we've all closed. Um, two issues with that one. Uh, the, the, cut and the cut and dry one is if you're continuing to raise money after you make that post. Some people close on the property, let's say today, and then they need to raise another 50 grand or 100 grand. And that may not happen for another week or maybe sometimes a month where they just need that extra 50 or 100 grand. Well, with that post, that's going to be considered conditioning the market. And that's going to be, a, that's not even conditioning. That's a specific quote. Uh, and so the next person that you raise money from, that's going to be a problem because now you've advertised your deal and your, your next investor is going to come in. That last 50 grand is going to be a violation of 506B. Uh, and then just in general, I don't like those posts too, because I don't know what the risk reward is from that, but it can definitely be considered conditioning the market for your next deal, especially if you have a deal just around the corner. So uh, that's what kind of makes me cringe the most. <laughs> For conditioning the market, it, where's the fine line with adding value, right? Because I think a lot of us, just like this podcast, we're really trying to add value and educate people. Um, and then we do do our own syndications as well. So is yeah. there a gray area there? Where, where does that come in? There's a ton of gray area. So that's, so that's one of the reasons I like to stay off of it, especially if you have a deal. But I actually do what you do. I, I have my compartment. So I say, this is clearly okay. This is clearly not okay. And this is the gray area. Adding value to me is actually okay. So I put that in the categories you can clearly add value. So there's nothing wrong with you making a post on social media that says, you know, you write an article of why real estate is the greatest asset class of all time for creating wealth or why the, uh, you know, the, why Dallas, Texas is the greatest market right now. Value add, get an email from there, right? Elite, elite capture, or maybe do a webinar, you know, hey, I'm going to do a webinar of why real estate is so great. You can do that as long as you're not talking about a specific deal or talking about, you know, deals in general, pure value add is probably the best way to continue to add to your list. Just be careful though. Remember, you're going to get somebody's email or contact information from that post, which is great. You cannot offer them a deal, right? If you're doing a 506B, you still must wait because you have to go through the steps and establish a substantive relationship with that new person. So you can't just offer them a deal right away. You've got to go through the steps, establish the relationship. And then you can offer them a future deal because you must have a pre-existing substantive relationship. And that means pre-existing your, your deal. Is there such a thing as preconditioning the market when you do not have an active deal going on at that time? Yes, it's possible. I'll give you the most egregious uh, form. Uh, you, you don't have a deal going on. You go on a podcast and you say, hey, we're awesome. We usually give our investors 15 or 20% returns. You should really call us because we know what we're doing. That's kind of an obvious kind of out there. But yes, it is possible to condition the market even if you don't have a current deal. And, and, the, and the post close one is a good example of that. Like in theory, you've closed your offering, you're done, you post that, that post and congratulatory post of closing. Look, if you've got a deal right around around the corner and you're about to start, you know, maybe you've already started advertising where people know about a second offering coming around the corner, that could be condition, conditioning the market. It, that's the kind of the gray area though. Really good information. All right. So let's say you, you executed your business plan, you sold your property. What do you need to do from a legal perspective to close out that entity? 
you really want to legally close it out. A lot of people, you can definitely just let it lapse. You know, some states like Wyoming, it's not a big deal. You just kind of lapse and it goes away. But really, if you want to do it right, you, you want to take the steps to legally close it down, which typically, and it's all state by state, so each state has a different process, but you would file some sort of a dissolution document that officially closes it down. Uh, but you want to make sure you, you, you know, in some states, you want before you can do that, you want to make sure you're paying all outstanding taxes. You typically want to keep, you know, you want to keep some reserves. If you look at most operating agreements, they actually require you to keep some reserves because you just never know. There might be suddenly an invoice that pops out from somebody you didn't know. Uh, and then probably the most important thing from a legal perspective is, is look into a, what's called a tail an insurance policy, called a tail policy. I don't have time to get into it. I'm certainly not an insurance expert, but a tail policy kind of covers you for anything that happens once you've sold the property and closed down the entity. Um, you know, things you just may not know. And, you know, just because you've sold the property doesn't mean that somebody, you know, maybe there's an issue with the property that you didn't know about. Maybe there's mold, you know, and then suddenly six months later, they're suing you for mold because you sold them the property. So tail, tail insure, a tail policy is really important, but do the official steps of closing down the entity. And that's going to be state by state. Uh, everyone's got their own procedures for dissolution. So, you know, we, we, our last deal, we formed the entity in Arizona and we had filings from, I don't know, 30 states because, you know, 75 investors. Do we have to, you know, communicate that with every single state or just Arizona? Well, you're, t I think you're talking about two different things. So, so you're talking about the filings for the form D. Uh, because yeah, are, yeah. you would not have had to, you know, you, you wouldn't have to have registered that Arizona LLC anywhere else. Though that you, you had a property presumably in Arizona, so you create the app. Your Form D is what gets filed in every single state, and there's nothing you need to do anything special with the Form D. The Form D you file, as you know, right after you start accepting monies within 15 days, uh, and then you kind of forget about it. And, and once you close, you don't have to go back and, and, and alert all those states that you've closed your offering. There's no obligation there to do anything with the Form D. Got it. Got it. So just the state that you incorporated the in. State, the state, and, and you may, and look, you may have registered it for some reason in a different state. I don't, you know, we typically wouldn't do that, but maybe there's a, maybe there was a reason why your attorney, maybe you did set it up in Nevada and then you ended up registering it in, in Arizona for whatever reason. So yeah, wherever you've registered it, you would have to dissolve it. But typically um, you're just setting it up in the state that you're, that the property is located. And at best there might be another one because, you know, you set it up in a different state to begin with. Thanks. Thanks. Kyle, pass it on to you to finish this up. Yeah. Typically we ask everyone that's on the show, what is your asset management superpower? But I'm not sure that applies to you. So I'm going to ask, what is the one thing that operators need to do from a legal perspective? If, if you had to choose one thing uh, to set up their entities the right way. Um, there's three entities that you should have. So that's probably just kind of big picture because we could do a two hour seminar on this, but you're, you're going to set up your property LLC, which owns the property. You're going to create a management company, a management, not your property management, your at kind of your property LLC management company that does all the managing. That's where all the liability is. And then you're going to set up a holding company that's going to own your interest in that LLC. So there's a property LLC or something that I call a syndication LLC, a management LLC, and a holding LLC, that'll take care of all of your asset protection needs. Perfect. All right, Mauricio, thanks for coming on the show and adding value on the legal side of things. In summary today, I learned a bunch of things. A couple, uh, make sure the PSA is assignable. Uh, make sure the LLC is created in the state that you're purchasing in. And uh, that tail policy actually was a big one for me for closing out. I've never heard of that. So that's a, that's a big one. So yep. please tell the listeners a little bit more where they can find out more about you. Uh, you can check out our website at premierlawgroup.net or honestly, YouTube, anywhere. You can just Google my name, Mauricio Raul, that uh, you'll, you'll find me somewhere. All right. So to all our listeners out there, thanks for listening in. If you like this episode, please head over to iTunes and Stitcher. Give us a like, subscribe, and review so we can continue to grow our audience. And we'll talk to you next week. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. We really appreciate your support. If you're interested in learning more about APT Capital Group and speaking to someone on our team, click on the link and schedule a call with us. We're here to help and we'd be excited to speak with you and get to know more about you and your goals. Talk to you soon.